Okay, we are live. We are here with Alexander Mercuris. How are you doing, Alexander? I'm doing very well and very delighted to be on this program with people who are able to explore this very important subject that we're going to be discussing uh, with us today and discuss it properly. Yes, we have with us today the fantastic, fantastic journalists, um, documentary filmmakers, uh, two gentlemen who know what is happening in Haiti, Dan Cohen and Kim Ivies, and you can follow their work. I have all their links in the description box down below, and I will have their links as a pinned comment as well. But um, Dan and then Kim, uh, where where can people find you? Uh, plug the places that people can uh, can, sub can subscribe to your work. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you guys, Alex and Alex, very much for for having us. Um, great to be on the on the the stream. Big fan of the show. Um, my work. So I have my own site I founded called the Uncaptured Media. You can uh, go to uncaptured.media, which just goes to my Substack where I publish. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Dan Cohen three thousand and uh, at Uncaptured News. Um, and then our documentary, which Kim and I made together called Another Vision Inside Haiti's Uprising. You can find that on um, my YouTube channel, on Uncaptured Media's YouTube channel, uh, under playlists, or also on Haiti Liberté's channel, which uh, Kim, you know, is, is the English language editor for Haiti Liberté. Um, so on either of those places. Fantastic. Kim? Yeah, well, I'm much easier to find. It's just basically HaitiLiberté.com. That's liberty with an E on the end. And our YouTube uh, channel is Haiti Liberté as well, and uh, where you'll find the um, the, the films, um, the, the series, Another Vision. Yes. Fantastic. And I will have all that information as a pinned comment as well when the uh, live stream ends. So a big hello to everyone that is watching us on Rockfin, on Odyssey, on the Duran.locals.com, Rumble, and YouTube. A big hello and thank you to our moderators. We have a lot of uh, important stuff to discuss. So Alexander, Dan, Kim, let's uh, let's get to it. Alexander. Well, indeed, let's let's absolutely because this is a very important uh, subject. It's a fascinating subject. I should say that when it comes to Haiti, it's a place which, in some ways, I feel I'm very familiar with. In other respects, not so much. I say very familiar with because, you know, I was reading C.L.R. James' book, The Black Jacobins, about the revolution in Haiti against the French in the 18th century, led by Toussaint Louverture, um, all way back when I was a student. And it was about the same time I remember reading novel by Graham Greene, The Comedians, about the time of the of Papadoc in Haiti, the, the very brutal dictatorship that existed at that time, which was in the late 50s, 1960s, 1970s. In fact, it dragged on for decades, that very cruel dictatorship. And yet, it, in a kind of a way, about the internal, what's actually going on in Haiti today, it's very difficult to get news. One hears that things are very difficult there. We have an uprising of some kind going on in Haiti at this present time. But reports about it give us incredibly little context, very little information. It's all explained in a very sort of simplistic way. And if we're talking about the current uprising in Haiti at the moment, it's basically, if you go to our media in Britain, for example, where I live, it's all about a collapse into chaos, uh, um, a takeover by violent criminal gangs, a descent into massive disorder with the outside powers, primarily the United States and Britain and other countries doing their best to try to keep the thing ticking together and helping it along, but always being confounded by the forces of disorder within Haiti itself. And that's never seemed to me to be a remotely satisfactory explanation of the events in Haiti. So it's actually a great relief to be speaking today 
to people who actually have some understanding, who have actual knowledge of the subject. So with that rather lengthy introduction, let's get on. We are looking at an uprising in Haiti at the moment. Lots of things being said about it by the media. Is it indeed a criminal takeover by drug gangs uh, moving to oust um, a government which, for all its imperfections, has been doing its best. Is that what the situation in Haiti is really all about? I mean, that's what I, the impression I get from reading The Guardian and listening to the BBC. But does that actually describe the situation we have at the moment? Um I, I mean, either of us, either of us can can yeah. feel this. I guess I, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll take a stab at it and then pass the baton to Kim. Um, I mean, I would say that is the complete inverse. You know, the description you gave of drug gangs taking over the country. Basically, drug gangs have been running the country in in the form of political parties, um, and the gangsters are not you know, guys in sandals uh, so much, but rather guys, you know, and, and big weapons that are worth more money than they'll ever see in their life um, in the slums. But they are the elites uh, in offices um, who fly back and forth from Miami to Port-au-Prince and, you know, live, maybe live elsewhere and have their kids live in um, another country and go to school in another country. And, and you know, they, they, they traffic drugs, they uh, pay criminals, they pay um, armed groups to do their dirty work, these kinds of things. This has been the status quo of Haiti um, for, you know, a few, really, I guess, since this is what has emerged since the U.S. essentially decapitated the Haitian, decapitated the Haitian government and essentially Haiti with a series of coup d'etats against the, the, it's its first democratically elected president, Jean Bertrand Aristide, who was overthrown by the U.S. first in 1991 and then again in 2004. And so um, so now we're seeing basically Haiti organize itself. The the masses who live uh, in the slums, in the ghettos, in the worst conditions that I've ever seen. I mean, if you you know, you go into the slums and you see people. Um, yeah, I mean, we see pictures of it, you know, when they talk about the horrors of Haiti and people living in tin shacks, these sprawling slums, and they collect water from the rooftop or from the ground, and there's cholera everywhere and disease and sickness, and people can't live in these conditions. So we're seeing them basically in a in a sort of organic way um, rise up from these slums to reject this regime that has been imposed by the foreign powers, principally the United States, but also by um, its kind of imperial subcontractors in Canada uh, and France. Um, so that's that's how I would describe it. Maybe, you know, Kim will be able to give, uh, I think, a much more, uh, an, you know, his own take. No, that's it. Uh, I'll just compliment yours uh, with an E compliment. Uh, the, uh, well, and I, of course, too. But uh, the group that Dan is describing are what the Haitians call the gangsters in ties rather than the gangsters in sandals. And, you know, it strikes me how similar it is if you look at the beginning of the U.S. imperial epoch at the early 20th century, late 19th century. Uh, you, you look at the old Harper's Magazine uh, uh, cartoons and, you know, it shows that people of Haiti in, in case of that intervention, and I think it was the same for the Philippines and um, you know, Nicaragua and other places they went in, um, as children, you know, just basically savages, children, they're, they're, they're African, you know, they're basically... Uh, they don't understand democracy. They can't deal with it. This is foreign to them. We have to come, you know, big brother. And you have pictures of Teddy Roosevelt with his big stick, you know, coming down, sort of leading a choo-choo train of boats uh, to uh, encircle these, these, these rebellious children savages. And this today is basically the same picture they're coming with, uh, you know, of course, uh, with, with a little more modern frills and uh, I think that, um, you know, this is just it, the demonization. That we, they're cannibals, for God's sakes. You know, mm. they're just so. And um, I, I would even date the beginning of this 
rule of the gang and ties back to really the fall of the Duvalier regime, which uh, you made reference to, Alexander, where, you know, there had been a struggle throughout Haitian history between really two ruling classes, the uh, what what are called the Grandons, which are the big landowning class, which Papa Doc and Baby Doc more or less represented, and then the comprador bourgeoisie in the cities. And uh, so Duvalier's 29-year reign from 1957 to 1986 essentially put in place one big gang called the Tonto Macoute, or Volontaire de la Sécurité Nationale, which Graham Greene so brilliantly illustrated. Uh, and uh, that kind of locked <laughs> the country into this um, uh, a state uh, of stasis, we could say, for, for that three-decade period. And after <clears throat> that was broken, because the U.S., a paradigm for how it handles its neo-colonies changed at that time. They used to use the strong arm dictators, you know, Pinochet, Somoza, Batista, uh, Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines, uh, et cetera, Duvalier in Haiti. And they started to say, you know, this isn't working because it, one, they're very corrupt. And a lot of things we send to build a road for uh, the U.S. company working there gets embezzled. Uh, and two, uh, they're creating too many Che Guevara's, too many revolutionaries. So we have to come with a new formula, which uh, Edward Herman called demonstration elections, where we do the election, we put in our uh, puppet the same way they do here in the U.S., you know, the candidate with the most money wins. And then we're going to conserve that. We're going to send the army back to its barracks and we're going to conserve it with the international peacekeeping force. That is the U.N. now becomes the uh, uh, guardian of the empire. And um, in place of Duvalier and his sort of corrupt clique of kleptocrats and macoots uh, emerged this, this comprador bourgeoisie with no longer the grand don, uh, a break on it just blossomed. And um, a lot of these, uh, this bourgeoisie actually are, were refugees at the beginning of the 20th century from uh, uh, Syria and Lebanon and Palestine. And so in Haiti, they call them the, either the Lebanese, they give them an Arab name, and uh, they're seen really as the, 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 the main culprits. And in many cases they are, but it's far from just those uh, uh, members of the bourgeoisie. And so really, yeah, the picture becomes much more complex. And so anyway, this is the underclass, really the lumpen proletariat of Haiti. And we can get into that more later, how this is really a new phase, I could say, in not only the disintegration of the empire, but the case of world revolution happening. And um, this is the uprising of the lumpen proletariat saying we can't take it anymore. Mm. I think a lot of people are not aware of how long, for how long the United States has been involved in Haiti, going all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century, that in fact, in fact it occupied the country militarily <laughs> for a certain period, and how intensely it continues to be involved in Haitian affairs ever since, um, well, then basically. Let's just deal with the people who we have been hearing so much about recently. As I understand it, the prime minister or acting prime minister who has just stepped down, he has never been elected at all. I mean, we haven't even had a, a, um, you know, a, a parodic election to elect him. And he was actually, as I also understand it, selected to stand or persuaded, made to stand after the murder of the previous president in some kind of a Colombian hit back in 2021. He was selected by the ambassadors of in Haiti, who are in, in fact basically the United States. Is that correct? I mean, he's an, he was an un, completely unelected figure who was in some way widely believed to be implicated in the murder of his predecessor. <laughs> yeah, have I got this correct? Because this is a bit 
I, I find this I find this in fact a bit confusing. And were there any plans to hold elections at any point with respect to this person, Prime Minister Henri, whom I've just been talking about? You want me to take that, Dan? Go ahead. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah. Yeah. So Ariel Henri had in fact been nominated to be the Prime Minister of Jovenel Moïse, who was um, uh, using a, another guy called Claude Joseph as his interim prime minister because the guy before him had resigned. So Ariel Henry was the prime minister who'd been selected by Jovenel two days before his murder. And that was arrived at really through negotiations from the former prime minister Jovenel's uh, uh, um, I could say mentor, a guy called Michel Martelly, and his prime minister, a guy called Laurent Lamotte, and they had a conference call, and he said, well, I'm thinking about Ariel Henry. Anyway, Martelly was really pushing him in. Uh, he'd been a, a collaborator of Martelly, uh, and we could go into that later. But um, And then the assassination happened two days later. So before he could be even be sworn in, he was supposed to be sworn in on that Wednesday, the 7th, but at 1.15 a.m., on that day, uh, Jovenel was executed in his bedroom, machine gunned by the Colombians. And um, so now there was a kind of an unclear period. And Claude Joseph, for two weeks, ran the country. And, you know, it looked like he was going to take over. And then suddenly the, the core group, which had kind of supported him, said, no, no, we're going to use Ariel, who is and kind the, of... The, the, the core group being the ambassadors. Is this right. correct? Is this the, these are the U.S. embassy-aligned ambassadors, yeah. right? It's it's basically, you know, the U.S. is always surrounding it with a bunch of quizlings. So they do it in the case of Haiti, too. And basically, they've run Haiti for the past 20 years, since the 2004 coup. They used to be called the Friends of Haiti, but they changed it to the core group. So... Now, um, the core group in a tweet, in a tweet, basically put this guy in power and he was running ever since. And um, uh, the U.S. was standing four square behind him, despite uh, challenges from a sort of a bourgeoisie éclairé group, uh, uh, enlightened bourgeois group, which was trying to put a few more little democratic uh, frills on, on the machine, but it also working essentially to get Washington's nod. So uh, essentially, yes, he had a hand in the coup, it is believed, because the guy who told the Colombians to machine gun Jovenel, he wasn't in the room, a guy called Joseph Felix Baggio, got a phone call from the Colombians, they described him, he said he's black, he's skinny, and he's about five foot whatever, you know, we described Jovenel, and he said, yeah, that's the guy, kill him. And they killed him. So now um, Badio, three hours later, makes two phone calls to Ariel and lasting seven minutes. The phone records show it. And when asked about it, Ariel said, I don't remember it. I was getting a lot of calls that night. He talked for seven minutes to the guy. Mm -hmm. So that's the most clear evidence that he was involved in the coup somehow. And there's a lot of rumors I believe him myself, that he was harboring Badio in a number of cases. So he was somehow involved in the coup. Uh, and maybe this was planned even well before Jovenel even tapped him. So in any case, it's it's a very, very Byzantine uh, scenario. So in effect, what we're talking about is a leader, the, the person who was leading Haiti was never appointed to that post by no. anybody in Haiti. No. He was selected by the United States and its friends quite openly. This is done without yeah. any real concealment after a um, group of hitmen murdered the previous president, yeah. who was a rather... Um, a rather questionable personality as well, as I understand it. So this person has never been, anyway, the person who just resigned was never actually appointed <coughs> to that post by anybody from inside Haiti. He was appointed from outside. Is it also correct that it was the Americans that Blinken told him to stand down a few days ago? I mean, is this perhaps Dan, Tim, Kim, could you confirm this as well? After this uprising took place, 
when it became clear that he wasn't going to be able to um, remain in control, the Americans told him he was outside the country. You know, you've lost control. You must stand down. And there was even a meeting, apparently. Is this correct? And am I getting this information correct as well? Yeah, I mean, the reporting, you know, that's that's come out um, about Ariel Henry's uh, resignation is that he, well, basically what happened was <clears throat> Ariel Henry had departed the country, I believe, on February 29th uh, to go to Kenya. Um, 27. Kenya all, he left. 27. He, okay, he, 27. He went to Karakam and then from Karakam he went to Kenya. Right, okay. So he goes to Kenya in order to basically sign a bilateral agreement with the Kenyan uh, government led by President William Ruto in order to have uh, a force of um, 1,000 Kenyan special force police officers come to uh, Haiti in order to fight these uh, so-called gangs, these armed groups, to basically stamp out this uprising. And the U.S. has been for months, I mean, really for a couple of years, trying to cobble together some kind of coalition of the willing, knowing that we can't send U.S. Marines, U.S. troops directly in because Haitians won't really go along with that. They are, they're very sensitive to foreign intervention from the United States for obvious reasons because of history. Um, and so they basically want to get a black face on it. The U.S. Blinken um, had tried to get uh, CARICOM to do it. You know, some of the members of CARICOM had agreed. The Bahamas, um, you know, had said they'd send a few, but a, a few cops, but. What are you know a couple of Bahaman Bahamian traffic cops going to be able to do against armed groups who are in their neighborhoods, in their nests, in the slums of Haiti? You need some kind of more powerful force. So they went to Kenya, which is the top recipient of U.S. Uh, aid in Africa, second to Egypt, um, and has a notoriously brutal track record. Um, in 2009, there was a report by the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, Philip Alston, I believe his name is, who mm -hmm. described them as death squads, these uh, Colombian police units. And so basically what's happened is there's never been accountability in the Kenyan police when the, the death squads, you know, the, the news comes out that there are these death squads, then they kind of, you know, officially disband the unit, reshuffle them, and then it emerges somewhere else. And and they continue to do the same thing. So this is who the U.S. is trying to get into Haiti uh, to lead this force. So Ariel Henry goes to Kenya um, in order to do this. And when he's coming, when he comes back, that is when the armed groups led by Jimmy Barbecue Cherizier, who's kind of the, the central figure in what's happening now, who you know everyone's hearing about, he they went and attacked the airport, attacked some police stations in order to force um, to prevent Ariel Henry from being able to land. Uh, so he goes, I believe, to New Jersey um, and then he tries to go back. He tries to fly to Port-au-Prince. And on the way, he gets a call from I don't know if it's Blinken himself, but basically from tries to fly to Santo Domingo. Right, right, right. Okay, well, I, wasn't he first diverted to Santo Domingo? No, no, no. He was going to Santo Domingo, and they were going to fly him over on a helicopter. Oh, right, right, And then, right, right. They, then they aborted the Santo Domingo front, and he had right. to go to San Juan. Yeah, so then they sent him to Puerto Rico instead, and now he's under um, FBI protection. But, of course, you know, Kim, Kim actually has a pretty bombshell report that he published uh, this week that, yes, well— yesterday yeah yesterday um from you know a very high ranking source that uh Ariel Henry is is under arrest by the United States and is being interrogated and they're thinking of sending him giving basically giving him to this new sort of uh um regime that they want to install in Haiti as a sort of sacrificial lamb so um i mean it's all it's all very fraught and it's really i would say a desperate attempt by the US to try to cobble together to keep you know the wheels on so they can get this foreign force into Haiti to stamp out um, this ghetto uprising is is really just, what's happening. And just to add, the re the other reason they really have to use a proxy force, Alexander, is because uh, the end goal the end goal is a thing called the Global Fragility Act. This is key. Passed under Trump. And the essence of this is that they bring in 
U.S. troops. They met, basically set up a U.S. military base in Haiti, and they put Haiti on a lifeline of U.S. humanitarian aid. And the whole point of this, this Global Fragility Act, is a response to China's Belt and Road Initiative because they see the continent, they see Africa, Latin America, everybody going over to China. So they're trying to build a bulwark against it. And Haiti is one of the last countries in the world, uh, there are only 11 now, that recognize Taiwan as the actual China. And so they're very anxious to keep Haiti for that reason. And also, as we go to war with China, they need a place where they can make all their you know, electronics and clothing uh, cheaply. In Haiti, it's five bucks a day, the cheapest in the hemisphere. So uh, this is the reason why. So they, they need this proxy force to stamp out the rebellion, make the election, and then the elected government can ask the U.S. sign on the dotted line for the Global Fragility Act. But So the U.S. didn't want to be too obvious to go in, put in a government. It asked them. They did this in 1915, and everybody cried foul. They don't want to do it again. Who are the people who are leading this uprising? I mean, you mentioned some names. Are they actually people with real roots in Haitian society? Or are they people who also will be in the end, you know, brought over to the side of the um, United States and, you know, the, the, the other forces that have dominated um, Haitian politics since the removal from power of Aristide? Well, Dan, I think you got that one. Jimmy Sherry's is. Yeah, really... yeah. I mean, either either of us can can yeah. you know go on about this. Um, so yes, the the key figure, the central figure, the one who is in all the headlines as the leader of the cannibal gang, if you see it on Twitter, um, as you know, the most dangerous, the most notorious gangster in Haiti is a guy named Jimmy Sherizier. His nickname is Barbecue. Um, which you know is perfect for the American, the Western media to run with, and the, the cannibal story. Um, and you know, if you watch, for example, Vice News, they'll say, uh, which which has actually led, really led, the disinformation campaign for three years now against Cherizier. They say that he got his name because he likes to burn his victims' bodies. He like you know he likes to light people on fire. Um, in reality, he got the name when he was a kid because. Growing up in the streets in his neighborhood, there are a lot of other Jimmys, and his mother sold you know, grilled meats on the street. She was a, a street vendor, and so he became Jimmy Barbecue. And so he's always had that name, and it's used very affectionately by his supporters. Um, so, yeah, Cherizier is, is a former police officer, um, came up uh, you know, from the gutter, basically, into the Haitian National Police, uh, was exemplary worked in an anti-gang unit called Udmo. And he um, was very good at his job. He was well-respected, well-regarded among, among the ranks. And what happened um, is essentially he was involved. Uh, he led a, 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 an ad hoc operation uh, against, against gangs in a neighborhood that basically without, you know, for, for, brevity's sake i won't get into all of the details so we can get into kind of the the very contemporary moment but basically the this anti-gang operation went awry um they thought they were just going to collect some weapons that were stored in a school and they were ambushed by some uh criminals who had weapons and killed some of the cops there was a bad a firefight between the cops and these gangs um these gangsters and um a bunch of people died. You know, we don't know exactly how many. It's not clear exactly who they are. But the principal, um, basically, so barbecue goes, you know, goes back to the base. The next day, the cops, the police congratulate him. They do a ceremony congratulating him and thanking him for his bravery. With the prime and minister. Then, with the prime minister. And then days later, the principal human rights group funded by the NED in Haiti, which is essentially an extension of the, the U.S. Embassy, um, publishes a report that calls what happened a massacre. And the police need someone to blame, so they blame Cherizier. So all of a sudden, it's all over that Cherizier carried out this massacre, um, and he becomes, you know, the bad guy, enemy number one. And he's like, you know, thrown under the bus by the police after his career of hard, dedicated work, risking his life to fight criminals. And so that alienates him. He's eventually fired from the police. 
And at the same time, he's he's very much a social leader <clears throat> in his community. He he uh, is a social leader in an in an area called Lower Delma. Um, Delma being this kind of main road, and each each street has a number. He's in Delma two, four, and six, and so he's a social leader. He um, you know gives people money for what they need. He supports the community. This kind of thing. And he began to create this social program where they had clean water uh, for the residents of his neighborhood, where there are basically no state services. So they have clean water. They have um, they provide security from criminals that are you know extorting uh, businesses, um, kidnapping, raping, robbing, robbing, murdering. So he they start he and basically the locals um, in his neighborhood. He organized them to fight back against these criminal groups to kick them out. Um, in as part of this kind of program that is essentially revolutionary in character in it within the neighborhood's borders. And so for that, the U S basically began to that this, this NED funded human rights group, which has played a very, uh, which basically served the same role in the lead up to the 2004 coup d'etat against Aristide, pumping out disinformation, inventing massacres, is now reprising its same role. So against Cherizier, they recognized him as a threat early on before Haiti Liberté understood what was going on in that moment. And, you know, I mean, I didn't I didn't quite get it until I reached out to Kim of Haiti Liberté and then we went to Haiti. Um, so basically what's happened since then, there's been this process of Jimmy Barbecue Cherizier, former cop turned, you know, social leader with a gun outside of the police. He said he basically got to a point where he said, look, this system is corrupt. It is totally against the people. There's no hope within it. It's just run by criminals. So what we have to do is unite the different armed groups, the criminals and the uh, anti-crime Units And so first he, he created something called the G9 Family and Allies. That was an alliance of anti-crime groups um, that sought to fight and defend themselves from the criminal armed groups that were basically on the payroll of the oligarchs to, where they would go and they would commit massacres. They would go and burn down businesses, basically do the dirty work of the elites. And so Cherizier and the G9, these nine different neighborhoods uh, and and then he also had the G9 family and allies. So basically other groups that he had negotiated um, essentially non-aggression packs with, even if they are criminal in nature. So he basically started, he's trying to unite all of them. And um, as he's fighting them, he's very reluctant to actually fight them. What he, he would go on, t, you know, on the radio or he would make public appearances or do YouTube videos where he would get down on one knee and say, Let's not fight anymore. You know, he's at a funeral. Let's not fight anymore. Let's unite. We have weapons. Let's turn them against mm -hmm. the elites who are keeping us in this situation. And, you know, he would, it was very fraught. He would get an agreement with this group this, of criminals and this group and this group, and they would stop fighting each other. And there would be an actual benefit to the masses. But then some oligarch would pour a bunch of money in, you know, to one group to attack it, to try to break up this alliance. And so this kind of, um, this, this has gone on for a couple of years. And finally last fall, um, September of 2023. And we had, we had been there just, you know, week or two before Cherizier announces an alliance of, um, of almost all the armed groups, the two basically main uh, the, the two main groupings, there's the G9, which is his, the one that he led. And then there's the, the G people, the J pep, uh, which is the criminal grouping. And he basically united these, which I mean, honestly, you know, Kim and I had been skeptical while he's telling us, this is his idea. Like, how are you going to unite with criminals? You know, guys that, that do horrible things, how can you unite with them? But he previously he told us that he couldn't do that. <laughs> yes. He in an, in another moment. I mean, he had he had told us both before. He had told us, you know, it's the way it is. I don't have a choice. You know, what do you see any other option? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have to unite with them in order to change the country. And they're from my same social class, so they're victims of the system too. And so we were skeptical of this approach. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, in November 22, 2022, for example, he changed he changed his tune in a way. Because what happened is the government of Ariel Henry, the de facto prime minister, 
at the behest of the United States and the IMF, imposed, they took away fuel subsidies. So the price of a gallon of gas skyrockets. There are mass protests in the street. And after a couple of weeks of those protests, Cherizier and the G9, they went to put barricade. They created a barricade in front of one of the main fuel terminals in Port-au-Prince. And the his main. demand, the main one. But I mean, it, it, as it turned out, there are two others in the vicinity, which, you know, yeah. the mainstream media narrative was this guy's creating a, a, a fuel crisis and everyone's suffering because of him. But we went down there at the time, flew my drone around and we saw, wait, there's still gas coming in over there and there's still gas coming in over there. So it wasn't what they were saying wasn't true. Um, however, he goes, holds up the fuel terminal, blocks it. So no fuel can come out of it for about two months. He managed to hold this off in, to in total opposition to the IMF and the U.S. and its puppet regime of Ariel Henry. And then Canada ended up sending in some armored vehicles for the police so they could overrun these barricades. And there were some very heavy uh, firefights. Um, he was also attacked by some of these criminal armed groups. And he realized, you know, we, t we talked to him at that point. We did the first interview with him after this whole uh, situation ended. And he said, I can't ally. How am I, you know, how can I ally with these guys who are, who are criminals who do, you know, who kill and rape and rob. Um, and I think, and it was, and it was a very, you know, principled statement and we agreed with him. And I think since then, what he's realized is I cannot go at this alone. I can, he's not, he doesn't have enough firepower, enough, mo enough money, enough men in the G9 to be able to fight these other criminal armed groups and the elite and a foreign invasion. So he basically went to his, he sort of went to what he was thinking before and said, I have to find a way to unite these guys. So he, so he continued to basically preach unity between the armed groups. Um, and, and that's what this, this Vivan Sam concept living together concept that he came up with that that he announced in september 2023 was and so it's not an endorsement of those criminal armed groups but it's basically we're going to fight against uh the elites so it's the situation it's a, if that i can hey, jump in he's in yeah go ahead kim if i can jump in it's a little bit like mao zedong <laughs> allying with chiang kai-shek to drive out the the the, the japanese in uh, early 40s uh, and even in Haitian history, you have two of the founding fathers, Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Alexandre Pétion. Uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who basically represented the freed slaves, and Alexandre Pétion, who basically represented the uh, mulatto elite, as they sometimes call it. That's a little bit of a misnomer, but it was the Afranchi, the freedmen, uh, who had kind of a different class interest. They'd been bitter enemies. They'd both been French generals, but they were bitter enemies. But they allied in May of 1803. And that alliance was what won them the first Haitian revolution. And on the Haitian flag, it says, Union fait la force, unity makes strength. So this is a kind of a similar replay in history. Can you tell us a bit about the situation, the, the economic and social situation in Haiti now? I mean, we've had lots of, I mean, there's lots of stories about how um, ground down poor it is there's also been the effect of the earthquake that took place recently there I mean, how bad is the situation economically and, and socially in haiti at the moment in port-au-prince and other places well i, I remember my mentor uh ramsey clark one of my mentors uh once telling me before i was deployed for a trip after the first coup d'etat in 1991 and he said, oh, son, it always sounds bad from a distance, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I got there, in fact, you find that people are going about living their lives, et cetera. And Dan and I just had to fly up to Cape Haitian on our last trip down there last month. And, uh, you know, you fly over the Haitian countryside and people are out, you know, tending their farms and doing their jobs. So a lot of this is happening in what they call the Republic of Port-au-Prince, about 3 million people out of Haiti's 12 million or so. Uh, who, uh, you know, live in this uh, area, I'll say, um, <clears throat> probably is six or seven square miles uh, on the sort of at the mouth of, of uh, Haiti, at the bottom of the mouth. So 
Um, yes, the, the Haitian economy since the fall of the Duvalier regime in 1986 has undergone a very drastic neoliberal structural adjustment, as they call it, where uh, the agricultural base, Haiti was uh, 80% uh, peasant at that time, um, and produced coffee and sugar and mangoes and plantains and a lot of things. But this has been crushed by uh, dumping from the US, uh, rice, for instance, in the Ebenite <laughs> Valley, used to be, you know, the breadbasket of Haiti, rice, which is a staple of, in the Haitian diet, was produced there. And uh, Bill Clinton, with his uh, Arkansas farmers, with their combines uh, a mile wide, were able to dump, you know, very cheap rice. Uh, so uh, a, a Haitian peasant with a hoe is competing against a guy with a mile wide combine. You know, it's no contest. So they crushed the rice production. They cu crushed a lot of that production. And so this peasantry fled to the cities. And, you know, we see this across Latin America, across the third world, as we used to say. And um, uh, the population, it went from 80% peasant to now maybe 50% or maybe even less. Uh, so that 30% went into the cities. Port-au-Prince, when I started covering Haiti in the early 1980s, late 70s, it was uh, 500,000 people. Now it's 3 million. And this is the case for the other metropoles as well. So these people are living basically uh, hawking uh, soda pop on the streets and they can't live like that anymore. So yeah, it's a very dramatic situation. And that's one of the things that's given the rise to these neighborhood committees, which as we were mentioning before, have become the state. They're the ones who handle all the people's needs in their neighborhood. And some of them turn to crime to finance their help uh, or taking care of their people. So it's a, um, that's, that's really, you know, what explains these pictures of flaming barricades and people running around that you see on uh, CNN. Um, can we go back to Aristide? Because the, the coups that led to his overthrow actually cut through in the sense that I think it was one of the things that, you know, the informed Western public did notice and were rather upset about. I mean, I, I can remember it even got into a James Bond film. I mean, the, the quantum of solace, partly, partly in set in Haiti. And there's even a brief reference there to the fact that um, you know, the priest who became president was overthrown, uh, um, partly because he'd actually wanted to make conditions for people better. And uh, this, oddly enough, said by the villain, one of the villains in the story. You said that it really starts the, the descent into this sort of regime that we have of people who are controlled from outside by the United States. It really, uh, and not just the United States, but, you know, this oligarchical, very cruel, cruel, delegitimate regime, the situation that we have now basically starts with Aristide. I, there's an awful lot said about Aristide at the time. I mean, he was represented, as you correctly say, as a negative figure overall. I mean, what, what actually happened with Aristide? Why was there so much opposition to him from the United States, from Hillary Clinton, as I sort of well remember, from people like that? And was that, did that opposition to him find a mirror amongst people within the country as well? Um, um, if we could just explain a bit about that. Yeah. Okay, I guess I should take this Dan since I lived through it. Uh, the uh, and you weren't born yet, uh, or barely born. Oh, I was. I, I was. I was six years okay. old when the yeah, first coup happened. Okay, so I think yeah. you have a better grasp. On okay, it. good. So, um, yeah, uh, it really begins with the fall of the Duvalier regime, and the U.S. thought this was going to be an easy fix. They said we're going to do it just like we've done in a few others, because this whole new regime change from uh, strong men to demonstration elections began a few years earlier. So they said, okay, we're going to push out Duvalier and we're going to, we have this World Bank economist, a guy called Marc Bazin, who we're going to, you know, simply insert. We'll just elect him. 
So uh, <laughs> they knock out the uh, Duvalier regime, and but there's four or five years, basically from 1886 to 1990, where the population, it's a genie coming out of the bottle. And in the beginning, they kind of say, okay, Mark Bazin, Mark Bazin. But very quickly, there's a anti-imperialist sentiment growing in the population. And I can say uh, uh, modestly that uh, the paper I worked with, a thing called Haiti Progre, uh, had a big part in this radicalization, which wrote, you know, wrote about uh, the American plan for Haiti. And as one... Uh, British journalist, uh, uh, Greg Chamberlain, I don't know if you ever knew him, he used to write for the a Guardian, and he once told me on the porch of the Olufsen, the hotel that uh, Graham Greene immortalized in The Comedians, he said, Haiti Progre made Aristide. <laughs> and so uh, the population becomes more and more radical and anti-imperialist in its uh, growing to the point where there's finally the um, showdown between this liberation theologian priest who emerged from the slums of uh, La Saline, where Dan and I have spent a lot of time uh, filming of late. And uh, the showdown totally was a malfunction of U.S. election engineering. They thought that it's going to be a cakewalk for Mark Bazant, but instead Aristide runs away with the election. When they stopped counting, which they didn't want too much of a humiliation, he was at 67% of the vote out of a field of 11 candidates. So this was the first great malfunction of uh, U.S. election engineering, and he took the election. And um, in fact, he became the model for what became the pink tide because Hugo Chavez saw this in Venezuela and Evo Morales saw it in Bolivia and so on and so forth. And pretty soon we were having these elections uh, that were putting in leftists of some sort uh, across the continent. So Haiti was the first, as always. Haiti is always the vanguard, uh, 1804, 1990. Aristide comes in, the U.S. say, OK, this is wrong. We got to fix that. So they, they carry out a coup in September 91. And... Uh, again, they think that'll be easy enough to do, but it isn't. Uh, three years of uh, repression against the people, and they still keep going and going. And finally, by this time, it's gone from Bush one to Clinton. And Clinton says, gosh, we got to try something. So let's bring him back. Let's bring Aristide back. But we'll bring him back in a cage. And we'll bring him back having to sign on to the neoliberal project. So Aristide does come back, but he uses a policy known in Haiti uh, of resistance, uh, it dates back to slave times where you don't openly uh, reject the master, but you kind of don't follow his instructions exactly either. When he says, you know, uh, step to the right, you know, you step to the left or, you, you know, you kind of do this uh, slow walk. And so that's what Aristide did. And the U.S. got vexed with him and they kicked him out. They didn't give him back the three years he'd spent in exile during that 91 to 94 coup. And plus they brought in, and this was Aristide's giant mistake. This was the biggest mistake he made because the Haitian constitution says no foreign troops on Haitian soil, 1987 constitution. And he invited in the UN peacekeeping force. He put Haiti under chapter seven. So this was all the U.S. needed essentially to now have open license to go into Haiti. And they did so. They brought him back on their shoulders, but to put in the overall <laughs> plan. He slow walked it. It went to a second guy who was often considered his ally, but they were really erstwhile allies. And he did a lot of these neoliberal reforms. And so this brought about really the neoliberal state we see now, which is, you know, basically crushing what existed of the Haitian state. And this was always the U.S. plan. I remember reading a USAID document, um, you know, 40 years ago, which said, you know, we have to change the, you know, I forget what the word was, modalities of governance. And essentially it was, we have to give it to the NGOs to run. We don't use the state anymore. We use the NGOs. And so Haiti now is called the state of NGOs. A, a colleague of ours just came out with a book called AIDS State, another fellow we know, uh, Tim Schwartz wrote a book called um, 
the um, uh, of great Haiti humanitarian aid swindle. Uh, these are both interesting books. People should check them out. I haven't read Aid State. But in any case, uh, the essence is the state became so debilitated that we've ended up with this kind of lawless situation. And the NGOs, instead of uh, really taking over, it's been, you know, these neighborhood committees and some of them criminal, some of them vigilante. But uh, and that's kind of brought us to the situation where we are today. Let me ask you both, gentlemen, the next question, the obvious question. Where do we go from here? Um, can a governmental system emerge out of this uprising, which is more connected to the actual life of Haiti, that might actually lead Haiti forward um, economically and socially, that might event at last fulfill some of the promise that um, the Haitian people have been given? You know, of a better future. I mean, or, or will it be the same again? That it will encounter this enormous resistance from outside, and undoubtedly also from some people within, and that will have you know the, the pendulum swing back, and um, you know the old regime will be restored in some way. Is there a potential out of this uprising for something new and different and substantive to come? out and what policies might it follow big question but uh, any thoughts about that i'll, t I'll take a stab and then uh and then and then yeah. give the mic to kim um i mean i you know we've been saying you know kim myself kim's outlet <laughs> haiti liberté which you know haiti liberté is a is a haitian outlet kim is the is the english editor so we're very much led by haitians um uh in this in this work this endeavor um, but we see Haiti is on a, in a revolutionary process right now. Um, and so with that, of course, the United States, as we you know detailed before, is seeking to to stamp to stamp it out, to strangle you know the the infant in its crib. Um, I think so, so you know this could go any which way. Um, I don't see that the US is in a particularly strong position. It's in a very weak position. Um, first of all, having to scramble to get some kind of uh, force into Haiti, um, which is really not going well. Even you know, right now, uh, the, the, the money that um, the U.S., the State Department wants to support this force is being held up in Congress because they turned in some half-baked proposal. Um, the, the Kenyan force is only a thousand. And, um, you know, they're obviously at a great disadvantage invading a country where you have um, armed groups that have some very heavy weaponry, some of them, um, uh, that are, of course, in their own neighborhoods, can blend into the population basically as any, you know, uh, guerrilla resistance can. Uh, the Kenyans do not speak Creole. They don't even speak French. Uh, they speak English and Swahili. Um, so they're going to... It's, if if this actually happens, it's going to be a total disaster uh, for the Kenyans themselves and, of course, for the Haitian population. Um, and it, it it's very it's very fraught. It's kind of held up. So who knows if this actually happens? Say this revolution succeeds, um, you know, they manage to to uh, put in their own native government. The Haitians uh, have their own government where the masses have a say i mean i think anything can happen at that point um i mean the basically what the u.s has done is trained a um a sort of ngo uh, soft power class that they are the ones who are vying for basically for power and the u.s has been planning to put in for years they saw ariel Henry as a, as what they called a transitional figure so the idea uh, was to get you know a, a friendlier face of liberal imperialism uh, ruling Haiti through these these figures that they've been training for years and years through the um, you know the NED the the, the IRI the the NDI these kind of soft power uh, organs but these ones are very much sidelined too and they are you know on on Twitter these days I'm getting attacked um, relentlessly by them they are the ones you know who are attacking me the most so they're equally threatened by uh, the prospect of uh, Vivan Sam by an actual you know revolution coming up from the gutter. Um, 
you know, when we talk to Cherizier about what what is your vision for the country, and he and he talks about this, you know, you can see him talk about it in our in our documentary, another vision. He basically talks about the conditions of the country that you have five percent of the population that controls, you know, roughly eighty five percent of the country's wealth. We need a situation where all of the the children of Desalines, as he calls them, can have a future, can go to school, can go to university, can you know these kinds of things. So, um, what exactly does that mean? Who know, you know? It's 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 very it's very wide open, and there are also other players um, who are kind of in the mix alongside Cherizier. So I think basically, if you know they succeed in main, in in basically taking back their sovereignty from the United States then you might see some of the conflicts come out, maybe the knives come out even between some of the, the figures who are kind of vying for it. But, um, you know, as the U.S., in, in this period of the rise of the multipolar world, as the U.S. is losing its grip, it's, of course, involved um, in an endless you know, war in, in Ukraine that is not going as it hoped. It failed to achieve regime change in Russia, obviously. Um, and uh, this Gaza conflagration, which is uh, a genocide, um, you know, you have to wonder how much juice does this declining empire have in order to kind of subdue the unruly island uh, of former slaves uh, kind of at its at its doorstep. And I would just add that, you know, these junctures historically of epochal change uh, are very fertile for revolutions. I mean, if you look at the Haitian Revolution, that was with the emergence of the bourgeoisie in Europe, you know, coming up, overthrowing all the old monarchies. And so, you know, it really worked. There was there was some disarray, we could say, in the ruling classes. I mean, we saw it on the other islands, Barbados, you know, the royalists were fighting the bourgeois. Uh, it happened, of course, in Haiti as well. So it offers an opening. And right now, in with the decline of the uh, U.S. empire and the emergence of the multipolar world, of the brick world, we could say, uh, there is an opening where Haiti uh, really uh, doesn't have the power of the U.S. readily available. I mean, we saw it even in the Second World War, during the Second World War, we saw the emergence of a lot of nationalist leaders, Vargas in Brazil, Peron in Argentina, Arbenz in Guatemala, uh, 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 Mossadegh in Iran. You know, so you see all these um, leaders who later were smashed down by the CIA and MI6, and et cetera, to uh, restore the power but uh right now uh there is some kind of opening right G gentlemen just two quick questions then very quick firstly in ha haiti because we talk about revolutionary situation in haiti i mean haiti has had one of the great famous revolutions the one that happened which you've we've referenced before the one in which uh, pétion and dessaline and Toussaint were all involved. Do people in Haiti today remember that? Is it, does it give them any sense of inspiration? Does it give them any sense of, you know, in, in courage? Do they remember that revolution at all? And both of you, you've seen Haiti, you know Haiti so well. Do you feel any sense of hope at the moment that this is the moment when it will finally break through? Because Haiti, it won its first revolution, and yet one senses that the fruits were stolen in a kind of a way. They had to pay this colossal subsidy, in effect, to the French, uh, who'd enslaved them. They had to go on for decades, paying a huge proportion of their funding to the French. And then, of course, the Americans came. I I is this the moment when they will finally break free? Well, I guess I could start this one, Dan. Yeah, I mean, every Haitian walks, walks in glory for what his ancestors did. And there's constant reference. I mean, since you're a kid, Haitians, I was raised in a Haitian household. Uh, you know, you, you, it's bitten into you, you know, how, how you have this historical role to play as your ancestors did. The first and last successful slave revolution, the touchstone of the revolutionary change on the continent of Latin America, uh, of South America. 
because it was, of course, the Haitians that gave the uh, uh, Bolivar all his uh, boats and printing presses and uh, arms and, and even soldiers to, to win over the continent. And you see the Haitian flag and all the flag of the northern uh, South American countries. You'll see the blue and red with the yellow band above it. Uh, so the, the, the Haitian population today is, very, I could say, the rebellious revolutionary essence of Haiti, born in 1804, after 13 years of revolution, uh, is in the DNA of Haitians. And so I think, yes, this is what gives me great hope that uh, this revolutionary process, even though they might send the 82nd Airborne to try and crush it and finally, but uh, I think the Haitians may very well prevail. Gentlemen, thank you very much. This is me. Oh, well, Dan. Okay, I don't know. Yeah. No, no, no. That's I, I think Kim sum, summed up, uh, you know, yeah. I, sh I share those sentiments. It's a, a rare moment of sort of revolutionary optimism, um, which has been it's kind of a, a, fre a, a fresh breath of air after just, well, the ongoing horrors of the of the Gaza genocide, which, you know, I spent a lot of time in Gaza and, and Palestine. And I know the place intimately. So it's so. Um, in, in total contrast to that, uh, Haiti is, is you know, given me kind of yeah. uh, new life in a way these, these last uh, few months. I was just thinking 82nd Airborne Division going to succeed in Haiti when Napoleon failed, which is actually, yeah, right. which is actually true. Yeah. Not, anyway, not likely. <laughs> not likely. Anyway, I'm going to hand over to Alex now. I'm sure that I'm sure you got questions. We've gone on. Uh, but I mean, it, it is such a compelling and important story that I think we needed to. So I, I'm going to transfer to Alex, and I, I'm yeah. sure we've got some questions to ask. Yeah, you guys got time for a couple of questions because totally. totally there are there are uh, quite a few questions. Um, let, let me just there's so many questions about the Clintons. So let me just bundle it up into one <laughs> just general question. Can you can you explain, uh, Dan Kim, what is the truth? about the Clinton's involvement in Haiti? Okay. Uh, this is kind okay. of a broad question, yeah, but there's yeah, so many comments yeah. and questions about the Clintons. So, I mean, I, I'm just kind of summarizing. Yeah. Here. Well, it all, stem, it all stems from the uh, story, even though it's not exactly true, that they honeymooned in Haiti. Uh, in fact, it wasn't their honeymoon. It was their second trip as a couple. Uh, but uh, they did spend time in Haiti back in the Duvalier days. And... Um, yeah, but I think th there has been quite a rapport, if only because politically Haiti uh, was part of Bill Clinton's rise to power. It was essentially Bush who carried out the first coup d'etat and Clinton said, I'm not going to pick up the refugees off the high seas, although he flipped on that and started to do so. Starting uh, Bush and Clinton both really started Guantanamo as a Haitian holding center. That's how Guantanamo got its start. Um, and uh, I mean, as a, as a place to keep people you don't want to bring into the U.S. justice system. And, um, and uh, it, the, there is a lot of talk about the Clintons are invested in Haiti. Well, it seems I have it on a pretty good source that it is true um, that uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, or I, I'm told, I haven't seen the evidence, but owns on the order of 1,800 acres of very um, important land in Haiti, starting in Bel Adair on the central plateau, going down to the Bay of Port-au-Prince, which is where there's natural gas. Um, and that BP, you see Jonathan Powell over, always coming. He's made 16 trips to Haiti, apparently, since uh, 2021. And um, there's another guy in Haiti called Emmanuel Parrett, who was part of this whole deal that happened uh, recently uh, between Haiti and Venezuela, where Haiti paid off its $500,000, uh, paid uh, Venezuela $500 million to settle its Petro Caribe debt, which was $2.3 million, basically Venezuela ate $1.8 billion. So uh, anyway, there may be this natural gas. They talk about oil. We, we were told by a source that would probably know that you can see oil oozing out of the island of Ganab, which is that little island in the middle of the Bay of Port-au-Prince. And people, it is proven about there being about 
two bill, two twenty billion dollars worth of gold dust in the mountains of northern Haiti, but you'd have to blow up the whole mountaintops and then sluice it with cyanide to get at it, thereby destroying the water table. <clears throat> so there's a lot of talk about the resources of Haiti and the Clinton's involvement in it. Hillary Clinton's brother um, uh, Rodham, I forget his first name, he died. He was part of one of these gold companies looking for that gold. So, yeah, I think the Clintons have, I don't know if it's central to all the Clinton financing, but I think the Clintons have played a role. And, of course, they're a flashpoint, uh, not only for the uh, right of uh, the U.S., or the right wing quarters, if we can refer to right wings anymore. Uh, but um, for many people, the Clintons are a flashpoint and for many Haitians, they are, too. You you answered another question which people had, which was about the minerals in yeah. uh, in Haiti. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was. Uh, I uh, tend to think though yeah. it's it's geopolitical right. positioning between Cuba and Dominican Republic, which has become sort of the the new Cuba base, you know, where all the corporations are based in Dominican Republic. So Haiti, if it goes Cuban communist. Uh, this is a big threat against U.S. bases and uh, U.S. Uh, power in Dominican Republic. Okay, thank you for that. For uh, from Urban Philosophe for Dan, if the U.S. fails to stop the revolution, is it realistic for China and Russia to replace the U.S. and help Haiti rebuild and stabilize if a new leader was appointed and protected by them? And if so, what's the timeline? If if this is possible. Well, I mean, I think any, you know, leader in Haiti um, who's genuinely looking out, I mean, any leader anywhere uh, on the on the geopolitical and anywhere in the world <clears throat> who's looking to uh, improve the conditions in their country genuinely is, of course, going to be looking uh, away from the unipolar order, which is, I mean, it, in fact, this is something we didn't address, but it's kind of important to understand is Jovenel Moise, the president who was assassinated back in 2021, that is one of the things he began to do. He was basically put into the presidency uh, to do the bidding of the oligarchs um, and the establishment political party uh, that, that was in power, um, but he eventually began to look you know look look elsewhere because he had some development projects he wanted to do he wasn't really from the political machine he was a banana exporter who was kind of plucked and and put into power um and so he started uh he went to turkey and um i believe he uh uh maybe kim you you have a little more detail on this but he mm -hmm. um uh he i think he met with the russian ambassador uh in venezuela so basically, well, he received the Russian ambassador. Mm -hmm. uh, he received the Russian ambassador, uh, took his uh, letters of credentials, uh, as it were, like two months beforehand, and right. apparently was trying to resuscitate the relationship with uh, Maduro because he basically betrayed it at one point under big pressure from Donald Trump, read him the riot act at Mar-a-Lago during a meeting. So he became the hood ornament on the U.S. tank working against Maduro. And uh, then supporting said, Juan Guaido. Yeah, that supporting is. Juan Guaido and all that. And then he kind of said, wait, this isn't working out too well. Decided to go back and started these talks with the, both the Russians, Venezuelans. And it seems that's where the U.S. said, OK, we got to give this guy the heave ho. Right. So that's a process that, you know, even Jovenel Moise hardly... <laughs> You know, a, rev a revolutionary by any by any stretch, um, he began to do. I mean, so you know, any world leader is going to say, okay, this uh, you know, the Leo the neoliberal model imposed by the U.S. at you know at the barrel of a gun is not working for me. I want to develop my country. Okay, what are the other players in town? Of course, China, um, and of course Russia. And so, if the revolution does succeed, um, I think there's that's something that of course, would be uh, a natural uh, a natural question or a natural process. Um, the Russians have expressed their willingness, and their public statements have expressed their willingness to be uh, to help mediate um, political crises in Haiti. Um, and so it would it would make perfect sense um, if if you know either of those countries did. I think China um, maybe. 
actually offered has four point seven four point seven billion dollars they offered Haiti to overhaul the infrastructure of Port-au-Prince, which has no sanitation, no electricity, no telephone service, no, you know, it's it's a mess, uh, as you can see in the pictures on or in the footage on screens all over the world now. So uh, they offered that, that was six years ago now, seven. And, um, you know, of course the U.S. said, you're not doing that. And uh, that's gonna be one of the big questions. I think the first thing, and the revolutionary government would do would be, you know, get in touch with the BRICS. Yeah. I mean, and also, um, you know, Haiti has a power, ha has a real chip to play with the Chinese because Haiti is one of 12 or 13 countries that still recognize now. Taiwan. If we, 11. Don't, yeah, oh. if we don't count the Vatican, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. 11, 11 countries that, that recognize Taiwan. So, you know, that's another reason that uh, Haiti is very important for the U.S. So if, you know, Haiti were to, were to flip, then um, you know, that obviously is an important piece on the geopolitical chessboard. Right. Great. Uh, Tisham says, thank you, the Duran and guests. And Lover of the Russian Tea says, I'm pleased you got Dan Cohen on the Duran. And another question about Obama. Why, uh, what was Obama's role in Haiti and why did he not help Haiti? Take it away, Kim. Okay. The Obama administration. Yeah. yeah. Obama, well, you know, that's basically a Clinton light, uh, if you will, or Clinton dark. Uh, it, it was, um, uh, I could say he, you know, one thing I always think is interesting in, in the U.S., if you have a drop of African blood, you're black. In Haiti, if you have a drop of white blood, you're a blanc, you're a white, you're a foreigner. So even though um, Obama would be a blanc in Haiti, but he was, it was welcomed by Haitians when, when he came in. And I think they had hoped for more, but he did nothing more. Uh, basically that period from 2008 to 2006 was, um, uh, 16 was, uh, a period where it descended even deeper into the neoliberal abyss. And I remember one famous bit of footage where um, uh, then President René Preval was at some meetings of head of state and he met Obama and he was totally, you know, giddy with delight. And at one point he wanted to introduce a friend of his to Obama. And so he goes over to Obama and starts to sort of tap him on the arm and Obama sort of brushes him off. So, yeah, I don't think Obama really saw Haiti as uh, the vanguard nation that it historically has been. Right. Um, let's do a couple more questions and then we will let you guys go. Uh, can you explain, uh, Dan or Kim, the relationship between the DR and Haiti, Dominican Republic and Haiti? <laughs> Boy, that needs a whole other Duran show, but you, you want yeah, to but, give a shot? <laughs> yeah. go, go for it. Go for it. You're going to do okay. a better job than Kim. So, I will okay. So um, DR has the ignominious historical distinction of being the only country in history who has chosen to go back into colonial status. Uh, the Haitians freed Dominican Republic in uh, from 1822 to 1844. Dominican Republic was Haiti. And um, in fact, uh, they would receive up on the little, uh, it's called the um, Samana uh, Peninsula up on the north of the Dominican Republic was where a lot of uh, African-Americans arrived, slaves from the United States at that time, uh, freed, uh, went there and set up a, a colony. So because um, Haiti was supposed to be where anybody who was enslaved could come and be protected and be freed. This was, again, before slavery was abolished uh, throughout uh, the hemisphere or the world. So, um, uh, but the empires worked it so that basically the Dominicans threw off uh, the Haitians, um, throughout the Haitians. And now when Dominicans celebrate their independence, they celebrate it from Haiti, not, not from Spain, but from Haiti, imagine. So um, it, there's this campaign has been done the same way that you see the brainwashing here or the brain dirtying here uh, to create, the, the, the Dominicans have 
been taught from infancy again to really revile Haitians and revile even blackness. Even Haitians, uh, Dominicans who have African blood, they'll say, no, no, I'm a, a, it's Indian. It comes from the Taino Indians, the Arawak Indians who were here before. It's not, it's not African blood. So uh, this shows the depth, the extent, uh, the power of the um, brainwashing that's happened. So in short, it's been a very difficult, tense relationship, and you'll never see Dominicans, even though they're clamoring for it, invade Haiti uh, uh, for the U.S. or anybody else because of that tension. It would really, that would be a, a nuclear explosion. Uh, so uh, the border, nonetheless, uh, is regularly crossed by both. And the people are essentially a crossover, you know, Dominicans married to Haitians, Haitians married to Dominicans, all along that border that you see running uh, between the two countries. So there's a lot of fraternity as well. Okay. Final question from Mr. Bluish. Um, Dan, how can NGOs play a constructive role in Haiti? And Dan or Kim, second part of the question is, can either of you comment on NGOs like the Lambie Fund? which seeks to assist the popular democratic movement by working with community organizations. Are you familiar with that, Kim? Uh, yeah, I, I, we can take the second one first. You can take the first one. Yeah, Lambie Fund, it's sort of a liberal, uh, progressive-ish posturing, at least. Um, I don't know it in depth. I've known some people who have worked for it. Um, I don't have anything bad to say about it. Uh, I know they, they mean to do well, it seems, from what I can see. Uh, by giving uh, money to peasant organization or a woman's group here and there. But a little bit, I think it's a part of the NGOization. I mean, there may be a role to be played for some of that progressive NGOization, but, um, you know, it's not going to change the fundamentals. It's uh, more or less nipping at the corners of the problem. But uh, as far as I know, Lombie Fund is, uh, is, is not a bad initiative. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't have, I don't have much, much to add to that. I mean, my, my view of, broadly speaking, of NGOs is not terribly positive, and they, end, and are often a kind of tool of, of soft power. And Haiti is the, you know, is the, the picture of that. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, every NGO is, is bad, or, or that, you know, NGO workers go with the, you know, bad intentions, may have the best of intentions, and, you know, perhaps can play a positive role. Despite the way to hell being paved with those. <laughs> right. Well said. All right. Uh, thank you to Dan Cohen and Kim Ives. Once again, where can people find you, Dan? And where can people find you, Kim? Uh, I'm on I'm on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Dan Cohen 3000. Uh, my, my site is uncaptured media, uncaptured.media. Um, and please check out our documentary, Another Vision, uh, Inside Haiti's Uprising, which you can see on that YouTube channel or on uh, Haiti Liberté's YouTube channel. And soon to be on its own website called anothervisionhaiti.com. Yes. We're going to move everything to there so we don't have to give people such a confusing roadmap. And I can be found my writings and work, uh, even though I write sometimes for, you know, The Intercept or... Uh, uh, the nation or other uh, journals, but mostly for uh, Haiti Liberté dot com, Haiti Liberté with an E dot com. And my handle on Twitter slash X is Kim Ives 13. Fantastic. I will have all that information as a pinned comment. And you can also find all the information in the description box down below. Dan, Kim, thank you very much for joining us. That was fantastic. Thank you, Absolutely. Alex and Alexander. Thank very you very much. much you guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having Take us care. on. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. All right. Wow. Great show. Thank you to uh, to Kim and Dan for, for joining uh, us. Absolutely. I've actually learned an awful lot. I mean, um, Haiti is such an in interesting and important place. Um, so much said about it that is so profoundly wrong. Yeah. Alexander, let's answer some questions yeah. on uh, on the Netherlands. 
Let's go over mm. to the Netherlands from Pauli. Dutch outgoing cabinet voted yesterday for taking the lead in getting hold on the confiscated Russian assets. How low can a country sink? Well, how indeed. Well, the Netherlands um, has been positioned for um, quite a few years now on you know the sort of radical anti-Russian end of the um, EU spectrum. A lot of this supposedly dates back to you know the events around MH17, which of course was blamed on the Russians and the investigation that was run within the Netherlands over H MH17. I think to some extent, intentionally fanned a lot of this um, anti-Russian sentiment in the Netherlands. I suspect that there's also been a reaction to it as well. We saw that in the last election when yeah, Wilders did remarkably well in the Dutch elections. We see also how, despite that, he's been frozen out. He's been stopped from becoming prime minister. Um, it seems that he's not ever going to become prime minister of the Netherlands. I can't say I'm surprised. And now they come up with these terrible ideas, which, as I understand it, even the United States is pulling back from, seizing assets. Cactus Ray, thank you for that super sticker. Stephen, welcome to the Drad community. Let's see here. Elena says, if the neoliberal order stands in the West, are we all going down in different flavors of Haiti? Well, I don't think it is going to stand uh, for much longer. I think it is looking increasingly precarious. I think there's a, uh, I think there's a growing backlash against it within the United States itself, which is why you're seeing all these extreme political tensions there, which appear to be getting stronger um, all the time with the election looming on the horizon. And um, I, I think it's failing. I mean, I think it's failing in Ukraine. It's failing in the Middle East. It's failing in all sorts of places. And if you want to see a catalyst of it, yeah, a, a, an indicator of it, look at how many countries congratulated Vladimir Putin on his election and look at which countries they are. The most important countries um, around the world, outside the collective West, are now quite clearly coming out, expressing their disagreement with this order that we're seeing. And they're doing it in the way that they know will infuriate the West most intensely, which is by, um, you know, congratulating um, Lucifer's representative on Earth, <laughs> Vladimir Putin, but uh, who's just uh, uh, won re-election in Russia. Mm -hmm. Christopher, welcome to the Drag Community. F22 Daniel says, any news on Gert Wilders? Uh, not much is talked about him since the Dutch elections. I, I've just described, I mean, a couple of days ago, yeah. he gave a, he made an announcement saying that he didn't expect to become prime minister of the Netherlands and that he's going to concentrate on promoting his program because the attempts, his attempts to form a government, exactly as we predicted, have failed. Yeah. Jerry says, uh, AM, Alexander. Curious, we share a birthday, so belated. HB to you and me. Happy yeah, you. Uh, thanks. Again, I just say I, sh I should do this properly. Uh, um, um, today, we were still doing a few things, Catherine and I, about my birthday, but I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who has sent me birthday congratulations. It's great to hear, by the way, that we share a birthday with someone uh, who is a member of the community, if I could say. But, um, you know, I've been very moved by all the good wishes that I've received. And this is my opportunity, my friend, to extend good wishes to you. It's nice to know that we say we share a birthday together. Happy birthday. Elza says, I was wondering if referring to the cannibals in Haiti, people actually mean the Clintons and their foundation. Looks like I was right. Yeah, I think you're wrong. Um, let's see here. Summer of 1970 says, thanks to Rand. Mama Alaska says it's horrific. The U.S. continues to do to Haiti. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see here from Odyssey, uh, questions from, let's see, breaking bread about the Clintons and Haiti. So yeah. a lot of questions about the Clintons and uh, Haiti. And breaking bread says, Americans are broke, time to take care of our own or die. I choose life, Jesus, King of Kings. Absolutely yeah. correct. And I mean, you know, I, I, if you know anything at all, by the way, about the history of ha Haiti and um, the United States, um, 
the United States actually had once fairly good relations with Haiti, you know, when it was a republic. They sense that they, you know, had a, a kinship together. Now, I, I just to say, last night, um, um, as a birthday celebration, my wife took me to see to watch Hamilton, uh, the musical, and uh, Alexander Hamilton, person who was great admirer, uh, uh, you know, greatly supportive of the revolution that happened in Haiti. Mm. I happen to know that. Miss Texas G says, uh, happy birthday, Alexander. Thank you and, very much, Miss Texas G. And um, Alexander, two questions from actually last week's live, which came in when we signed off. But let me yeah. let me uh, get these two questions to you, and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, from Rebel King, the Western governments read the book, have, they read the book, The Art of War Backwards, and got it completely wrong. <laughs> True enough. And Sparky uh, asked, did uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II not visiting in Israel stem from the bombing of the King David Hotel? It could very well be, actually. I never thought of that, but it's entirely possible. Um, the, the bombing of the King David Hotel took place during the um, um, campaign of... Um, um, well, it wasn't ill good, but it, and it wasn't ill good. Anyway, a, a uh, um, Jewish group led by i think by menachem begin who became eventually israel prime minister israel's prime minister the british were running palestine at that time under the mandate that they'd previously been given um they were uh, at that point they were setting their face to some extent at least not not entirely against the setting up of the state of israel and um there was a campaign against them and insurgency against them over the course of it uh, there was this explosion there was a bombing attack on the king david hotel which is still an important hotel in jerusalem i, I understand british soldiers and officers were killed there were other incidents in which um, british soldiers who were captured were executed and it's entirely plausible that the queen the late queen who would have remembered all of that 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 put her off going to um going to um um to israel it, it is well known for example that she did not want to visit russia until the romanovs were buried i mean apparently she even said that to um boris yeltsin when he visited uh britain so i mean she insisted that you know before she visited russia she wanted nicholas ii and his family their bought their remains to be found and to be given a proper burial because she felt very strongly about that. So it's entirely plausible that she may have felt something about the King David Hotel affair. I don't know this for a fact, I should stress, but it would be in character. Well, interesting about the, the Romanovs. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, uh, Alexander, that is everything. Any final thoughts before we sign off for the evening? Well, I think we've had an amazing program, actually. I, I, mean, I just said to come back, I learned an awful lot. And I really do hope that Haiti finds its way at last. I mean, this country deserves it. I mean, after all that it's gone through in its history, I mean, uh, it, it needs a country. If, if a country needs a break, Haiti is one. And it's got, uh, you know, an extraordinary culture and, you know, uh, lots of resources, as we've heard. Um, finally, you know, that it can fulfill its promise and become a you know a, a fully active and engaged country within the global community and a happy one as well as it deserves to be. Yeah. Uh, one final uh, comment from the Alkali is the political class, the court sensing that with free speech platforms, the leaders can speak directly with the people and they lose power to influence. They cannot convince the emperor of the fine new clothes anymore. I think you're absolutely uh, putting your finger on very important issues, which uh, uh, we have to be careful what we say. But nonetheless, I think you're basically correct. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you to uh, Dan and Kim once again for an excellent show. Thank you to everyone that joined us on Rockfin, on Odyssey, thedoran.locals.com, and on Rumble and YouTube as well. And a big thank you to our moderators, Reckless Abandon, Zarael, uh, Peter is with us, T 
Fish M is with us. And uh, who else? Did I miss anybody? I'm just scrolling through right now, Alexander, to, to see the moderators. I don't think I missed anybody, but if I did, um, I apologize if I did. But thank you to our moderators for always uh, helping out. And uh, Alexander? Indeed. Until tomorrow. Uh tomorrow we'll be back tomorrow in the meantime again also thanks to everybody and to the community for your questions and to our moderators for your indispensable work thank you take care everybody thank you.